Hello and welcome to episode 15 of the Sport Flex podcast. And I'm happily joined by a former Premier League player and current West Ham on the 14s coach, Zavon Hines. How are you, my guy? Yeah, I'm good, man. Um, thanks for reaching out. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, I'm all good. That's right. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Um, how's lockdown been for you, anyway? Um, it's been it's been strange, a bit difficult at times because I um, haven't been able to coach as much on the grass, but I've been doing a lot of Zooms like this. <laughs> um, um, and I, obviously I've been doing my coaching badges, a license as well. So it's been a lot, I've been doing a lot of stuff on the computer. So it's been different to what I'm used to, but it's been an eye opener. That's good. And how's the family, friends, everyone good and healthy? Yeah, yeah everyone's good. Um, I haven't been as affected family-wise as other people, which I'm quite blessed about and fortunate. So I'm just grateful to God for um, preserving all of our lives and Amen. saving us from all this stress. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's all good. I can't complain. And just finally, lockdown, have you been keeping fit? 5k runs jogs yeah yeah at the start I was on it I was doing the home workouts and all of that kind of stuff and I was doing five no well, not five 3k runs with my <laughs> friends and uh, five is too long I've done with that yeah, <laughs> um, I've, I've been doing a lot a lot of workout to be fair that's what keeps me going um keep me mentally stable so yeah I've been active a little bit that's good that's good to hear now we've only got a short amount of time but Let's just take it back to like when you were just starting off playing football. Like, how was your upbringing and growing up? Um, upbringing, it, it was it was different to most people that's played football. Um, at times it was hard. At times it was very difficult because of limited resources, um, depri- deprived background as well. Um, mm. I was born in Jamaica, oh, okay. so um, and I moved here when I was eight. So I, I went from one sort of poverty to a more upmarket poverty in England. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it was all right. Um, like, I, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, it, was, it was, like I said, it was difficult, but it made me a bit more focused on what I want to be and not what I don't want and what I don't want to be. So, um, mm. yeah, it was, it was good. That's good to you. And how did you first get involved with playing football? Was it you watched it? Or um, no, nah, when I was in Jamaica, I always used to um, play football. My mum and my dad at times used to say I used to kick everything when I was walking to school. I was kicking stones, mm-hmm. bottles, cans, all of that kind of stuff. So from a kid, I've always kicked things. <laughs> I thought I'd have been a karate kid or something like that, but yeah. I ended up falling for football. And um, once I came to England, that like, football was my my thing. Like um, from primary school to secondary school um I just I, I loved everything about it and mm. uh, yeah I was just blessed to have done what I've done so yeah it's good yeah and who were your your footballing heroes or sporting heroes growing up that inspired you um when I was growing up sporting he- heroes obviously I was at Arsenal well my family was at Arsenal people mm. uh, so I, I'm an Arsenal fan as well Big along up, with my obviously. Um, and I grew up supporting them and I love Thierry Henry, um, Ian Wright. And but I also love the Brazilian team, so R9 was my man. <laughs> oh, nine, then, yeah. <laughs> then Ronaldinho came on stage and then he just took took my brain to another level yeah. where I, I just tried to do bare freestyle like he used to do on the pitch. So um yeah, those four. It stood out for me more than a lot of people. And they're proper players, like obviously big idols to Yeah, yeah, proper players. And obviously people say Messi's been the best. Mm. Um Pele, Maradona, all of that kind of them them people. But I never watched them. I, I was probably I was too young to see them play. Yeah. Uh, but R9, what, what he used to do at a young age, yeah. He 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 made me fall in love with football. <laughs> Crazy. He, he, he used to destroy defenders for fun. And it, it, it looked so easy for him as well. Mm. And then Ronaldinho came with his little samba move. Mm. And it looking all, yeah. Mm. It, it, and then that whole Brazilian team at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah it was outrageous. So, so what do you think of Brazil now? Do you think like people like Neymar 
are to that level. No, I, I, I love Neymar, but um, um, I, yeah, I, I like him ability wise, but I just think he, like his ability, he, he could do a lot more. Mm. Um, but then I think sometimes the players that's around him don't help him enough. And I think he don't help himself because of his head as well. So uh, there's a mm. there's a lot to it that I think. But ability wise, like no one could question his ability, man. His skills, yeah, he's outstanding. Yeah, he's clear, man. Clear. Yeah, yeah. Also, was there any other sports you enjoyed or were interested in pursuing before you felt you wanted to go the football route? Um, no, not really. I used to do uh, athletics in school, mm. like sports day stuff and all of that kind of stuff. But then I I done athletics as well for a little bit. Um, but no, nah, not really. Football was always my thing. Like, mm. um, yeah, I was from from a young age. I was probably the, one of the best in the school, so I just stuck with that. Like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was good, man. Like, um, yeah, football has always been my thing, and um, I'm happy, man. I'm happy that I was blessed to have this that talent at the time. Anyway. Okay. So, how did? The how did you get scouted by West Ham? Like, who was you playing for at the time, and how did they reach out to you? Um, yeah, I remember like it was yesterday. I done. Um, I spoke to someone the other day about it, and I was with my local team. Obviously, I grew up in Brixton when I moved okay. to England, South, South London, Brixton, yeah. South London, yeah. Um, and then I was playing for my my Sunday League team, and my Sunday League team back in the days, we we were so good, man. They had just proper, proper ballers, yeah. Mm. And then I was one of them as well. So, it, yeah, it was good. And then we went to a tournament in Watford. Mm-hmm. And um, it was called the Watford International Tournament, I believe, at the time. And we was playing in the amateur version. And the professional version was playing across the pit, like a couple of pitch across, across the road. And where West Ham, Arsenal and all these other professional clubs, they were playing against each other. Yes. So we was playing against all the other amateur clubs within, um, yeah, London, basically. And basically, my team went all the way to the final. We won it in the end, um, and I scored four goals in the final. Damn. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, I didn't think nothing of it. Like, I just thought, yeah, um, yeah, I was just happy to just be playing football. Obviously, I've always wanted to be a footballer and all of that kind of stuff, but we've done that. Nothing nothing was said to me after that. Um, so I went home as normal. Um, this was like on a Saturday. Then on a Sunday, my my the manager of my team at the time, he called me and said, oh, West Stan wants to take me on on trial. Right. I, was, I was like 15. I was like 15 at this time. Oh, okay. So um, I was obviously, I was excited. Because of season, I always wanted to be in a professional club kind of thing. So yeah. then the following week, I went in to West Ham for like a six-week trial. Um, and then I trained on the Monday. And then there was like a game on the Wednesday, I think. So I trained Monday, Tuesday, played a game against, I think it was like Colchester or someone like that. can't remember exactly who it was. And then I scored in that game. And then I played on the Saturday. Again, we had another game. And I think it was like against Palace or someone like that. I can't remember exactly. Um, and I scored in that game as well. So um, obviously it was a six week trial that I was on. Yeah. So after, after a week, obviously I just we obviously as a kid you just ask, go and ask and see how you're, you're getting on because I, obviously I was nervous as well at the same time. But I wanted mm-hmm. to make sure I'm doing okay or enough to actually be in the um, manager's consideration to get signed. Um, so then I went into his office or the change room at the time and he just said, ah, oh, we want to sign you after, after a week. So, um, a week? yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and bearing in mind, like I've never been in a professional club before that. So mm-hmm. I just play in the league and I've never been coached properly. Mm-hmm. Um, the majority of the coaching session for my son, the league team was five aside games. Mm. <laughs> there's no coaching tips or coaching points we just get on football and mm. yeah so for that to happen obviously was a it was a big milestone for me and a big achievement considering where I obviously I grew up and I came from so yeah that yeah it was special mm. yeah and it's crazy when you think about it because you hear a lot of footballers say they got rejected three four five times went to this club that club but for you to get like one and done 
that's that's brilliant. That's after a week as well. Yeah, I remember. Like, I think when I was in year seven, I went to train with like AFC Wimbledon when there was AFC Wimbledon in London at the time. Uh, before they did the new form Wimbledon and it, that's when they had like all the Arsenal players like the Kieran Gibbs and oh. all of those sort of players they used to be be there um, and I I, tra- I just went to train for like a week and then that was it nothing came of that this was like when I was in year 7 I was about 12, 13 yeah. uh, and then I just continued playing football then the next opportunity I had at West Ham I, I made sure that it will be my time. So, yeah, it was, it was a good... Yeah, and also, so when, when you was coming through that West Ham, you've got your, I guess, scholarship, I guess, at this time. Who who yeah. else is, is at the club at these times, like, you're competing with or you, you watching and thinking, wow, mm-hmm. I'm really this person? Um. So when, when I first got a scholar, um, I was, like, the fourth-choice striker, fifth-choice striker so at the time. So there was me and another guy called JJ. Um, and then there was two second years. So I was the first year. There was two second year ahead of me. Yeah. Uh, one was Hogan Ephraim. He used to play for QPR. QPR and, yeah. Tottenham as well. Yeah. So um, he's done. He's done. He done well. And he he was obviously ahead of me. He, he was a good player. Um, and then there was another guy called Denzel. I think Denzel. And there was like them them three ahead of me, and I was like the f- fourth. <laughs> Um, I was like, all right, cool. Like, gotta do what I need to do to try get get what I need to get, kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah, it was just it was them. Yeah, it was it was good though because they're good people as well. So it was it was a nice age group that I had. That's good. And I was just researching and I saw that you went on loan to Coventry. So that like, speak about how that move came about. Um, yeah, that one it was a surprise. <laughs> um, but a good surprise, and I'm happy it happened. happened. Um, I remember I was training with the, not with the reserves at the time, and I basically our training session finished, and I I was just about to get a new car, so I, right. I kind of left. <laughs> I kind of left training like straight away. Normally, I'll just hang around, probably do some extras and stuff like that. But obviously, I had an appointment to pick up the car, so I, I I went there with my agent at the time to go pick up the car. And you know, being a young kid, getting it, getting your second car, a decent car, like I was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna drive back to Brixton, show my friends, <laughs> trying to, yeah, Might get trying it to be... <laughs> no, 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 it was good. I, I knew everyone, so everyone, I was, I was well protected, connected. So I was Ricky. good. Ricky, yeah, yeah, I'm Brixton, yeah. So, um, so I, I drove back to Brixton, and obviously I was with my with my friends a little bit, and then it, it was around like three thirty, four o'clock. And then I got a call from the secretary at West Ham at the time saying that, oh, the gaffer wants to speak to me. Mm. So obviously in my mind, I'm thinking, what have I done now kind of thing? <laughs> like, um, and it was Alan Kerbyshire at the, t- at the time. Yeah. And then I'm like, okay, cool. And then he came on the phone and he's just like, um, Coventry wants to take me along for till the end of the season. So I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's it. And then... Um, yeah, but he said the only thing is I've got to be at the stadium to sign the loan forms before five o'clock. And these times it was like three, three thirty. So I was in South London and I'm thinking mm. traffic, I'm gonna get there. Um but yeah, I, I think I picked up a couple of tickets on the way. So I made it happen. Speeding. <laughs> yeah, I, I went in the bus lane, I went in everything. <laughs> I, I made sure it happened. Yeah, and I obviously I got there and I and I signed. And then two days later, um, I drove up there and Chris Coleman was the manager. Um, yeah. And it was good for me because there are some good players. Um, Leon McKenzie, um, yeah. uh, Elliot Ward and a couple of other decent, decent players that, that obviously I know. And it, that there helped me massively because before I was playing youth team football, reserve football. And then that was the first time I learned what it means to play for three points on a Saturday, mm. uh, and it helped me mentally to grow up as a as a young man. Um, but yeah, it was good. It was good, and I had some good times. Uh, played, never started a game, mm. but um, I came off a, on came came on in every game, and I scored one one goal that apparently helped them stay up that season. 
Nice, man. <laughs> big guy. Yeah, so, big game player. <laughs> <laughs> so that was good for me. And I was only 18 at the time. Mm. So it was, it was good for me. Yeah, and also on that, you're 18 at the time and you you have to live in Coventry, I guess. Not too far from London, but still, at such a young age, you've probably got no family or friends. How was that experience trying to fit in to a new place, a new club? Do you know what, club? If I'm completely honest, I never really found it as a problem because I wanted to play football. Yeah. And I wanted to play for the first team. So I, I, I didn't really think, oh, I'm going to struggle. or And I didn't really struggle. I was there for six weeks. I was six, seven weeks or two months mm-hmm. towards the end of the season. And they put me in a hotel for the whole time. Um, and it, it was fine. Like when, whenever I needed to go, I had a day off, I'll come back home. So obviously it's, it's not too bad. It weren't too bad. And because it was my first loan, I was excited. Yeah. Um, just be playing first team football or being involved and then around the first team. So for me, it was just a great experience. I didn't find it difficult mentally living away from home because I still had um, my family and friends that will come with me up there as well to see me. Okay, that's good too. So you've had your own currency, you come back to West Ham and how did it feel when you put on the claret and blue shirt for the first time, you've come on, you're playing for a Premier League club as well, like, let's keep it real, like, not everyone, a very few percentage of people get to do that. How was that experience? Uh, uh, it's, I, I, could, I could say the cliche things, like, oh yeah, it was exciting, it was amazing, like, I can't, I can't really explain it to you. And every interview podcast I've done that asks me these questions, I say I can't really explain it. Mm. I could say is, it's a feeling that's unexplainable because mm. I hear that. the only way you're able to explain it is by actually being in it, and you have to feel it. Yeah. And because I, my journey to get to where I've been, coming from Jamaica, get signing for academy late, mm. uh, having six months to w- try to win over, get a scholarship eventually getting a scholarship, then being injured for half the season, then not knowing if I was going to get a pro, then be getting injured again, and then being able to not, and then also doubting yourself as well within that time, just because mm. there's our player that's been pushed ahead of you. All of that, for me, it was just like, it was a great, um, it was a surreal kind of achievement because at some points in my life, I didn't even think that I would play for the first team. I know I was a part of the um, the academy and I wanted to play for the first team did I actually believe it not completely no so for it to actually happen and then I look back at the journey I was like oh yeah this is mm. this is what dreams are made of. so I was happy I guess it's like when people have their children it's like you don't know how it feels until you have your own child like how exactly. good it feels exactly that so yeah it's that time there like the, the first my first game was um in the Carling Cup against Macclesfield as well. Scored. And I scored, yeah. So <laughs> that the whole thing, like emotions and sense of achievement and living out my childhood dream as well. Because as a kid, you always think, oh, I want to come on and I want to score the winning goal. Oh, I want to score a goal. Mm. You always think. That. And I, to actually do that, yeah. it's, for me, it was, it was a major thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's special. Yeah, we'll, we'll speak about that game, uh, the the Aston Villa game. Won the penalty and scored the winner. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and they were, yeah. Aston Villa had a good team that year. I was even looking at Ashley Young. That's when he was proper on, yeah. on team. Yeah, yeah. So like, nah, it, that, yeah. yeah, that game. Like, I remember that game because the, the games before I wanted, I, was, I started. And that game, obviously, I wanted to start. But mm. um, we had two good strikers and that I was learning off as well. And... It was Carton Cole and um, Franco from Villarreal. Oh, Guillaume Franco, yeah, yeah. Franco from Villarreal. And he's probably technically one of the best players I've ever played with. Really? He was, he was outstanding. Yeah, he was outstanding. But no one will give him props because he didn't. he's not a player that will set the, the pitch oh, alight. Mm. You know what I mean? Kind of things. But what he does and how he does it is so clever. So mm. I was learning a lot from him and Coley. So I de- in that game... Both of them started, and obviously I was on the bench. And then in the first half, Coley got got injured, so I came on for him. Um, and then 
I think within like five, 10 minutes, I was just, I was hungry. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, I was hungry, hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I knew what it feels to be like uh, when you're starving. You know how it feels that mm. uh, that's how hungry I was. So it, every time I got on that pitch, I tried to be as effective and try to do something for myself and for the team, first of all. Yeah. So uh, obviously the, the situation, how it happened and I broke through and I, I was played through for... And then I got fouled for a penalty. That feeling there, getting up, knowing that you won a penalty, and then you got thirty thousand cheering. Yeah, like, that's that's there. Yeah, that's what you live for. You're um, lucky there's no VAR back then. <laughs> nah, that was fine. I would have been offside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd have been offside, but we're, we're good for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So for that to happen, and then, like I said, last minute uh, to score the winner. Yeah, that one there. Crazy. Took, took, took me to another place. That's when um, people started to speak more about me. Mm. Uh, and yeah, that that one there was emotional for me. Because that's just like we, like kids kids always dream about these moments. Yeah, like you man. dream about making a debut, you dream about scoring a late winner and all of those, those sort of things. You dream about playing for your country, you dream about all of these type of things. Um, and then for that one there to actually happen, score the late winner, um, and seeing like the West Ham fans, yeah, like no one understands until you're there and playing at Upton Park that there, mad under, ground under the lights as well at night time. I think mm. that you can't you can't replicate that. Mm. Um, so for yeah, for that to happen that day, um, at times it was emotional for me. Yeah, it was. It was uh, because, like I say, I always think about the journey mm. to get there, the setbacks, um, injuries. injuries, the doubt of others as well, doubt of myself about my own self as well, and then to f- like I'm looking at the picture now. <laughs> it's like it's right there. Um, <laughs> to think about, um, yeah, it's, it, it gets emotional, and then to actually go past all of that and able to do that and for us to win the game because we needed them points as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was a big moment. And also, speaking of big goals, you also scored a big goal probably in West Ham's biggest game, the Millwall game, the crazy game, the violent yeah. game, fans on the pitch, yeah. everything. Like, just speak yeah. about that whole day. Was you told before the game happened that? Yo, this is a serious thing. It's like no joke. This is a serious game. You have to win, and stuff like that. Nah, um, I knew. I came through the academy, so yeah. we used to play Millwall in the in the youth team and stuff like that. So I knew. And then um, you will always hear things um, from other coaches um, and stuff like that. So you, all, I, I knew what type of game it was. What really surprised me was how intense it was the like the rivalry and how much the fans actually hate each other um <laughs> and obviously i didn't know where it stemmed from yeah. but i knew that there was football fans there's there's rivalry anyway yeah. and it, i knew that Millwall was West stamps i didn't go do my research to find out the big detail of why it actually yeah. started so um and i remember that day we was in the hotel in Canary Wolf at the Four Seasons. Um, and we, we was having our team meeting. And as we're walking into the team meeting, we're hearing that, like, oh, the, it's crazy packed outside the stadium. There's, yeah, it's, 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 like, it's like that Champions League game <laughs> when Liverpool was pulling in. And you yeah, see the fans yeah. outside, yeah. That's, that's the picture that they gave us. <laughs> Right, so that's, that's what I was like, yeah, this is this is big. So then, obviously, we done our team meeting, got on the coach, and um, we was arriving to Upton Park, and it was so hard to get in. Like normally on a Saturday, um, you know, the coach is cool to get in. Like it's not as busy so early. So, but the fans came out in force from yeah. at least two hours before kickoff, and the roads was rammed. So the police had to like help escort us into the the stadium and it was just big the fan as we're driving you, see, you could hear the fans and that screaming like come on kind of thing and then once you clock eyes with one of the fans they just start screaming in the name kind of thing 
it, it was it was it was good in that sense. And then obviously we parked up, we walked we walked off the coach walking into the stadium into the stadium. And then as soon as we got into the dressing room, one of the staff must have said to us that someone got stabbed outside. Oh, I'm, like, I'm like, yeah. That's when I finally realized this is mad. It's like like a this gang is, beef thing. <laughs> yeah, and it is though, it is really yeah. intrigued. That's what it is. And that's when I finally realized, yeah, this is crazy. Like th- this means a lot to the fans. Mm. Um and I was obviously slightly frustrated because I was on the bench at that game as well. Yeah. Obviously, you was going to start these games. Uh, so then, obviously, the game started and then they scored, obviously. <laughs> yeah, they scored. They scored first. And so, they was hanging on for ages. Mm. Hanging on. And then my, my, my boy, Junior, he got the equaliser just before, just before full time. So, sent us into extra, extra time, which was obviously amazing because... I knew once we got into extra time, it, th- their time was up. <laughs> yeah. Kind of Momentum so shift. After, yeah, yeah. So after that, we I won a penalty again. <laughs> uh, you got got How about that? Are you sure it was yeah, a penalty? Are you sure? It was a handball. Yeah, yeah. It, it can't pick up the ball, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah, and then Junior scored that. And then obviously to round it off, obviously I got my, I got a, tendency to get the last goal of game so Mm -hmm. I got the third one which was a sweet one for me so um, Mm. and every time I see the West Ham fans that's all they talk about to be fair so yeah yeah, so it's it's good man especially given that West Ham Mill they don't play very often I think since then they've only played each other I think twice (laughs) until this day yeah yeah so and obviously that's a cup game as well so it's a knockout thing so Mm. there's Bracken rights also um and obviously the the rivalry anyway, so it was it was a big thing, man. So yeah, it's, it, that day opened my eyes massively to yeah. the extent of the rivalry. Yeah, and I guess during your time at West Ham, you've seen the highs of being you no know, Millwall, you being Villa, but you've also seen the lows, like relegation. How how was that like being relegated, and how did the fans just like how was you? reacting to the fans because they must have been really angry like how do you yeah. Yeah. um yes yeah, is that one there is it's tough obviously no mm. no club wants to be relegated and no fans wants to see their team get relegated um at times obviously it was difficult very difficult to to actually comprehend that West Ham is going to be in the championship because in my eyes West Ham is a big club massive club so yeah. Premier League uh, deserves in, to be in the Premier League and for us to underachieve so so much and actually go down. Um yeah, it was it was it weren't good. Um there's a lot of aspect to it why why that happened. Um but yeah, it was tough. It was tough. And I don't wish relegation on no one, <laughs> just say that. <laughs> mm, yeah, it must be tough, difficult. And also speak about like the injuries you had because you didn't play a lot of games, but you had a big injuries at West Ham. And so how does how do you continue to be motivated when you know you're not going to be playing for a whole season? Um yeah, I've only had like one proper injury and I was out for like eleven months. Mm. And obviously that was a long time. And it can get frustrating going to training just to go to the physio room and then you're seeing all the teammates outside practice playing what you actually love to do as well. Mm. And not being able to do it. Um, yeah, so it was difficult at the time, but I was fortunate to have good people around me. Um, that, that was that was one of the main things. And I knew who my father was. Yeah. People won't, don't understand what I mean by that, but I knew God. And I knew that at the end of the day, um, he's got a plan. My, 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 yeah, he's got a plan. And my journey is not going to stop here. Mm. This is just this is just another learning curve for me to push on and get mm. better and better, be stronger. This is part of part of the plan. So I, that, that was one of my main driving force. Um, like I said, good people around me um, and good TV series. <laughs> <laughs> that, that helped me, that helped me like <laughs> to switch off from football a little bit as well, because if I continue to think about football too much, I, I do get in my head a little bit. So, um, yeah, that yeah, I, I was around good people, man. So it was good. Yeah, that's good. And how difficult was it to like eventually leave West Ham? You know, you came in at the academy, fifteen years old. 
and then to leave like was it a difficult decision or was it a thing where it's like I need to leave and play some no, it, it, it was difficult man it was difficult um I didn't I didn't want to leave mm. um so but that season when we got relegated they offered me a new deal mm. and my agent was was deep uh, sorted out at the time Sam Aldice came in yeah and obviously my my deal still weren't sorted by pre-season time so where we when we was playing our pre-season games he was putting me with the reserves and oh. kind of isolating me a little bit little little things that they would they'll do and little things that they would say at times and then towards the end um, I had a conversation with him and he just made it sound like he's not really bothered if I was there or not so mm. even though the contract for the first offer was on the table, it was mm. just like, oh, it's there. You, if you want to take it, you take it. Then whatever. But yeah, just certain things that he done and certain things that they said at the time, um, I, I felt was unfair. Mm. And I just, wanted, I was a young kid that just wanted to play football. I was injured for for however long. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, you do want to feel uh, wanted as well. Of course. Um, he didn't. He was obviously didn't want me. Mm. Um, so and he wasn't bothered if I was there or not. So I decided to pursue something else. Mm. And if I if I, I could have proved him wrong mm. uh, by staying and showing him that um, I am the I am a good player and I am part of this club kind of thing. Um, but along with decisions with my agents and all of that I could have been advised better as well yeah I could have made better decisions as well I don't I don't always blame it on others but yeah at at that time I didn't like I said I didn't want to leave but it's just how it happened it was it was a little bit frustrating yeah plus these times you're still like quite young early 20s so it's not an easy decision to make like I'm early 20s now I couldn't think of like making a big decision like that where to play your, it's your job at the end of the day, you know what I mean? Yeah, I was, I was 21, just turned 22, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was difficult because, like I said, West Ham is my club. That's where I grew up. Mm. That's my only, like, my first ever club. So I, I wanted to be able to fully um, prove myself, even though I have to, I did to a certain extent, but I wanted to play a lot more games, scored a lot more goals. That, that's what the vision that I had. Yeah. But um, I just didn't feel that that vision would have been fulfilled with that manager at the time. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. And after West Ham, you go to Burnley. Burnley? Yeah, yeah Burnley. So yeah, how, Burnley. Yeah. So how, how did that move come about? Um, so it's, it's, it's off the back of that, my agent was, spoke to Eddie Howe, who was the manager at the time. Yeah. And he, he wanted me to come up there Um Obviously, it was a big thing to move all the way to Manchester at the time, but oh boy. Uh, I didn't really think about it, if I'm honest. I just thought I just didn't want to go and play and enjoy playing some football again and focus on being a better me kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah, it was it was different. It didn't work out how I wanted it to, want, wanted it to. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't change it because like I said. I am where I am today because of these stepping stones. So mm. it, it, it's, it was a good but eye-opening time for me. Mm. I guess it's difficult, like, in football, like, to go, know go where to go, you know, to pick the right places, to play. It's difficult. I think, I think sometimes if you have the right advice from people that's been in the game, yeah. it can be a little bit easier. Um, I, I, back then, I don't think there was enough of that for players like myself. Yeah. Um, I I wouldn't like like I would never blame anyone for my decisions or what I what I done or what I said because at the end of the day it comes from me. I'd, yeah. So I've got the final say, if you know what I mean. But certain things influenced my decision making and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's it's part of the, part of the game. So yeah. Nowadays, nowadays there's more people like me that wants to help kid have a longer career and a better career that's good and eventually you end up at you know Bradford City you you embark on one of their most memorable seasons I mean in the mm. most recent memory the League Cup yeah. 
run and also getting promoted. Like, yeah, what explain that season? That like, what season that one must have been? No, it was, a, it was a that's probably one of my highlights of my career. Mm. Um, because of the the history that we created mm. for the club, and we had a good bunch of players, um, that shouldn't have been playing in League Two, but for whatever reason, that yeah. that's how it happened. Like and that's yeah, that's what football is sometimes, and that's just how it works. So, some players end up at certain levels because of lack of opportunity or misjudgment, mm. whatever it is, there's so many different, but we had good players and the manager at the time made us jail and work for each other. Um, and we was able to defy a lot, a lot of people, well, not defy, um, come against a lot of doubt, yeah. um, especially when we was playing in the Carling Cup Oh, against all sure. the Premier League clubs. So everyone thought we were getting knocked out, but we defy all the odds. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we was able to do something special until the final. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a fashion, but I mean, I don't think anyone expected you to win it when you got to that point, but... Yeah, no, it was, it was a good achievement to even get to the final. Um, mm. we, we knew that. Um, so we were just trying to enjoy the moment. Mm. And... For us at the time, it was like I said, it was massive for the club because we was in League Two, yeah. beating Premier League clubs and getting to the Car- Carling Cup final at the same time, mm. and then on top of that, getting promoted. Yeah. That's that hasn't happened in the club's um, history. So for us to be, make history and that, for me to be a part of that is that was another highlight of my career. Yeah, and also speaking of that, is it more disappointing given that you beat Wigan, Arsenal, and Aston Villa? And you lost to like Swansea City. I know they were a good team, but to lose like that by five, isn't it a bit disappointing? No, not for me. Um, not for me, because I, I don't I, I know that you could lose to anyone. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't yeah. Like I like I, I saw Arsenal lose to um who did they lose to the other day? They they lost to someone that I'm like this oh, season also be losing to everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like, and for yeah. me, like you can lose to anyone. And at the, at that time, Swansea. They was playing some good football, man. Meet you, man. I, yeah, I meet you. Everyone know about meet you when you one season. Him. <laughs> when you got, when you see this, you know yeah. something's happened. It's long, it's long. That's a celebration. That, that listen, he, he was a player, and they had a good squad, and mm. had a good manager in loud drop, and yeah. their start, their style of play is something that I resonate with now. Mm. They play, play that free flowing football that, um, it's hard to manage. And we, as a League Two team, our our tactics just couldn't come close to theirs. Yeah. Uh, so they, they was able to pick us off five times. <laughs> <laughs> but even like, how was the experience like coming on at Wembley, packed stadium? Again, that's another milestone that very few people get to do. Yeah, it, it, obviously it was great. But I, I played at Wembley before. Oh, okay. Uh, when I was um, with England 21s. Oh, okay. So it, it, it obviously it's always good to play at Wembley, mm. uh, but it's, that day, especially because of Bradford's fans, they've got some unbelievable fans. Like mm. they're passionate. So think about a League Two team bringing forty thousand fans to Wembley. Serious? It's not. It's not happening. <laughs> it's not. But they did it. Um, mm. So yeah, it was good, man. It was good for the club, most of all. Um, good day out for the fans. And it was just a good, it was a good experience for myself, man. Like I, yeah. like you said, playing at Wembley, not many players get to do that mm. in front of a packed Wembley, 80, 80 90,000 people. No mm. chance, no one. So that's like, even though we lost, I look back at that bit and think, all right, cool, we lost. But then the positive for me is playing in front of 90,000 people. Is, it's not, not every kid does that. And also a final question on the Bradford, like that Carlin Cup run, like everybody knew when it was a corner to Bradford, it's long. You don't want to <laughs> see the corner to Bradford because yeah. you were just... Uh, our thing, yeah, our, our thing was set pieces. Like we knew that a lot of lot of goals um, get conceded from, from set pieces. And mm. that was one of our strong points as well. So we yeah. tried to utilise it. We practised it. We practised it a lot. Uh, we tried to come up with different techniques but majority of the time the simple ones worked mm. uh, so it, it was good man like that was our thing set piece <laughs> uh, lovely 
I just because you've got a short amount of time, just fast forward into like you eventually had to retire. I mean, was it 30, you were 30 years old, which is really quite young in football? Yeah, retiring, like, no, it's funny, it's funny you say that you say it's quite young in football, but then if I was out of contract and I was to go to another club to say that I want a contract there, they'll be like, Oh, 30 is a bit old, I need a younger yeah. player. <laughs> yeah, it's catch 22, he's old but young at the same yeah. time. Yeah, so, um, no, nah, it, was a, it was a time for me. It was the right time for me. Obviously, I had a couple injuries on the way. Mm. Uh, that I felt that... It, I just felt it was time because I was playing in a bit of pain at the time. Mm. And I just didn't like playing in the conference. I didn't like playing in League Two. I kind of fell out of love with the game because of a lot of uh, politics and mm. uh, different things within the game that a lot of people don't see. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people won't see it because it's not in your face like that. It's similar to racism. Yeah, <laughs> some some racism is not in your face, but it is. Oh, yeah. Um. But yeah, it was it was it was difficult for me. It, it, it was a difficult decision to just say, "Oh, you know what? I, I'm going to do. I'd rather do something I'm in love with, mm. and that's I'm doing it now." So at the time, playing, getting up, and going to games, and certain times going to training, I went. I, it was like a job. It was a, like a chore. When I was f- when I first started out of football, it wasn't a job. Mm, it was my enjoyment. passion. It was my love. It was like it was my enjoyment. You see me smiling and even cussing because I'm angry. <laughs> like <laughs> because I'm happy. Like I want to. This is my thing. But towards the end, I weren't happy. Like I didn't want to go training that much. I was fucked. Um, obviously, I did because I love playing football. But mm. then what came with football? That's what I didn't love. Yeah. Uh, and that a lot of times the stuff off the pitch affects what's on the pitch more than people realize. Mm. And a lot of things that used to go on within when you're in the lower leagues as well affects a lot of play, people's game. And mm. because I was playing in a bit of pain at the time, I was like, I rather I rather be able to walk around, be happy when I'm 40, 50, than running myself into the ground for um 500 pounds to a grand a week yeah. after tax after tax my friends was getting more than me so <laughs> i'm like you know what i'm not I'm not doing that if, if i want to pay the bill i'm gonna do something that i love yeah and get paid for it as well so mm. and for me it's not, it weren't always about money um t- sometimes some people said that was a bad thing because when a club is ready to get rid of you they get rid of you yeah. um ruthless yeah they're ruthless so because it weren't about the money for me, because I could have easily, I had like a year and a half, two years on my contract left when I, when I started, when I said that I'm gonna stop. Yeah. And I could have, I could have easily just ride it out, but it were It's not my style, and it's it's not who I am. Um, and then for me to get money and not actually pl- play, and people say people say it's dumb, but it's uh, it's I just don't feel that. It's, it's the right thing to do, mm. especially the things that with, with the things I believe in. So morals. I just said, yeah, my morals. So I just said, all right, cool. It's my time. Um, and very off to coaching. Mm. And just like, it's amazing that you've gone into coaching, like a nice transition. After you retired, was there a lot of help for footballers? Because listening to Holmes Dennis's interview, on the Judy, we were speaking about it, saying that there wasn't much help given to him when he retired. Was there a lot of help given to you when you decided to hang up your boots? No. No. Um, I, I was just fortunate that I knew people in the game. Yeah. But help-wise, as in to readjust. PFA. Yeah, the PFA was there. They offer you certain, some different things to, to do, like courses to go on, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, you're telling if you're telling a guy that's um haven't been in college or uni for 10 years plus mm-hmm. or I haven't done any work like that to then go and start to study and do coursework so I'm going on this course it's gonna it's it's a big transition is yeah. and if you're not someone that's used to that or didn't like doing things like that it's going to be difficult mm. so the transition will be even harder you've got to think about how, how to study and then you also have to deal with retiring. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a catch-22 with that, I think. But 
um i don't i don't think there is enough people that reaches out to you and to but then like it's it, it's hard as well i think mm. i do think it's hard but how i am as a person because i'm very driven and in being the best me i knew that my setback is i can't sit there I can't just mm-hmm. sit down and do nothing. So I knew I had to push to find another avenue of um, income as such, because obviously I, I, I got twins. Mm-hmm. So for myself, because I got twins, I can't sit at home and think for them mm-hmm. to look at me as, as a bum. Two mouths to feed. <laughs> no, no, I've got, how I live my life, I need to be able to inspire the people around me. Yeah. I have, I, I've got this big belief in being a man. A man either provides uh, or support. And if I'm providing and supporting my family and friends, then I'm I'm comfortable. I'm happy with that. So I could, even though I've had set, setbacks, those those has only helped me to become who I am and to be more focused on being better. Because mm. I can't sit negativity. It's just, that's not my life. Yeah, it's true. And it's interesting you were speaking on that because obviously your coach at West Ham on the 14s and I've seen recently that younger players such as 17 have been committing suicide after being released and they don't get enough help when they get released at these very young ages because it's, it's a heartbreak because that's your dream. What? How do you navigate that? Because I'm sure you've let go of some players at such a young age. How do you help them after they've been released and get them into that the real world? <laughs> It's it, it's it's tough, but I'm, obviously I'm fortunate that I'm not the one that actually releases them. Wow, <laughs> so, um, but what I always do, I always try to keep a relationship, yeah. and because I've been in the game, I, I try to make them understand that, and I show them different examples of mm. players that have got released and have made it. Yeah. Uh, so my thing is, if as a kid, if you could see something, you believe it a lot more. If you're an adult you have a bit more wisdom about you to know that, all right, cool, he's saying this and he's coming from a right, a, a correct place. But if you're a kid, you're a bit more emotional, a bit more, a little bit more immature and all of that kind of stuff. So if a coach like myself is saying certain things to you, you might just think, oh, he's just saying it because he has to say it. Mm. So I try to understand them as a, peop- uh, as a kid, the people that they are before a football player. Because at the end of the day, the reason why these kids have committed suicide and stuff like that is because they're actually human beings. They have emotions, they have feelings. Mm. And basically they feel that we've kind of taken away something that they love from them. Yeah. Um, so I could I could relate to it. So it's, it is a difficult f- thing to contain or to um, to to judge, I guess. Mm. it's difficult but um, you just have you just have to try to be as authentic and as real as possible with them I mm. think a lot a lot of people could see someone that's real and I'm hoping that my kids that I've coached in the 13s 14s and some that's in the 15s now knows me as a person that I love what I do but I care more about their success than a, a training session yeah nice and, and given that you're a coach now which coaches have you taken tactics off or which coaches inspire you to be a better coach? <laughs> um, obviously, I, you always say the, the ones that... The world, the, the, everyone um, wants to be Pep. <laughs> everyone wants to be Pep. Yeah. Everyone. But I, I just, I think he's a genius in just the way he thinks and he, the way he moves. Yeah. But I also love Brendan Rodgers. Yeah. I really, really, really like him as a coach. Underrated. Uh, because he develops young players and the best coach, the best managers are the best coaches. And to be a coach, you need to be a good mentor. You need to be a people's person. You need to be, you need to be able to understand what someone's going through on the pitch and off the pitch. And you have to get to know them. Um, it's, it's easy putting on a great practice as session, session design, but if mentally off the pitch the kids are not in that right place, that session design is going to be irrelevant. It's not going to be how you want it to look in your head. Yeah. So the best coaches for me do that consistently and then they improve players more and more and then they add more to the players. Mm. So I, I like Brendan Rodgers. I like uh, Pep, obviously. And I like Arteta. 
Arteta, yeah, he's, he's good, man. He's good, Arteta. And a good point you said about how there's coaches and there's managers. There's a big difference. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah there's a big difference. I think some managers manage a team. Mm. Um, the best coaches manage individuals. Um, best manager. Did, did I get that right? Yeah, the best managers just manage the team. The best coaches manage the individual. They only um, and the individuals. For me, as a coach, I've I've realised and I've learned by my own research and whatever I'm doing that the individuals make the team, yeah. not the other, not the team make the individuals. The individuals need to learn how to play as a team. That's what makes the team. So if I'm able to help the individuals to understand themselves as an individual first, and then add to to them being a team player and how to be effective on and off the pitch, that will help them be more of an all-round person mm. and then round um, player. So that's what that's what that's what I live by. And until someone proved me wrong, then I'm gonna run with that. <laughs> that's solid. And uh, just last five minutes, just a couple of like a quick fire questions. Um, who were like the yeah. most talented players that you've played with and played against? Oh, that's a tough one because I played against a lot of players. Um, played with uh, Junior Stanis, that's obviously he's, that's that's a given. Jack Wilshire, when I was on at England under 21s, mm. he was outstanding. Um, Daniel Storage. At the time, um, Phil Walcott as, as well. Yeah. No, nah, there's a lot of good ones. There's a lot of good ones. Like I said, Franco from West Ham. Yeah. Uh, or, or who's the hardest fullback you've come up against? Or defender? Hardest fullback. Yeah. Um. Remember, I played against Glenn Johnson when he was at Liverpool. Oh boy, he, he, he was good. Um, oh, just fullback. There, there's been some tough ones. I just can't. It's it, because it, right now it's a bit hard to just say, "Oh yeah, it's this player." Yeah. Um, your f- favorite stadium you've played at? Uh, favorite, Upton Park, Wembley. Um, good resume that. <laughs> Yeah, Alston Park or Wembley. Nice. Um, who's your favourite coach you've worked under? Favourite coach? I've got two. Uh, well, three. So I, li- I liked Zola when I was at West Ham. Yeah. Um, and I like, till this day as well, we worked, well, he works, he's under 18s coach at West Ham, but he was my coach when I was at West Ham for the 16s reserves and then first team. It's Kevin Keane. Kevin Keane, yeah. You took yeah, a West Ham for a short period, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he's he's good, man. He's top top. And um, Wayne Burnett when I was at Dagenham, oh, he was okay. a good. He helped me understand who I was as a as a man, then a player. So which which helped my game massively. Nice. Um, is there anything you'd change in your footballing journey? Anything that would change? Yeah. Um, no, I don't believe it. No, no, no. I think when you start regretting things, it says a lot about who you are as a person. Mm. Um, and for me, if I would I change certain things? Yeah. But do I regret it? No, I don't really regret things. Okay. And if you weren't a baller, what do you think you'd be doing? If you weren't a baller? <laughs> yeah, if you didn't. I don't know, I'd probably be a rapper. Really? <laughs> you got buzz? Nah, nah, I'm joking. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I don't even know. Nah, I, I used to love uh, stuff like carpentry and stuff like that. So mm. probably something in that field. Carpentry, building things. I I, I like that from, mm. from a kid. I, like, I love building those things, but I haven't done it for years, so I don't know if I'm good at it anymore. Oh, yeah. Just um, two more questions. Well, what did you buy of your first paycheck? Did I buy my first one? I can't remember. I knew it. it must have been some trainers and clothes. <laughs> Come from Brixton, we had limited. It was there limited. Was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
We needed to get the fresh kicks. That's <laughs> where I went to that Brixton JD. <laughs> yeah, JDs. Yeah, definitely JDs. Um, and then we had some like some trainers shop around the corner in Brixton that we had the latest stuff. So definitely trainers or tra- a tracksuit. I was a cat for tracksuit back then. Oh, fair, fair. And finally, what advice would you give to like young bowlers coming up, playing now in their journey, yeah. in their careers? This one changes a lot when I get up to this, but um, this time I would definitely say, I'll say two things. Um, under, know, know why you started football. And the reason why I say know why, because the, the why is, is basically your end goal kind of thing. Mm. Um, and if you understand the why, then the, the bumps along the way won't stop you. You'll go over it. So my why was my family, and I knew once I get injured, if if I'm on, if I give up, then I won't be able to provide for them. So I had to keep pushing. So I understand your why, um, and also be consistent in all that you do. If mm. you're consistent, consistency break resistance. So um, if you're consistent in all you do, and you're doing that at a top level, working hard practicing or doing whatever you need to do nine times out of ten you get an opportunity then it's just about you taking it lovely and that's some nice wise words to end it on another big <laughs> thank you to Zavon Hines for coming on it was a really intriguing um, interview and episode and all the best for the season with the West Ham boys no um, problem thank you. I thank you for having me man um, I appreciate it so I'm glad I'm glad you called me on so Thank you. No worries, man. Have a great day and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, top man. All right, right let's speak to you soon. Yeah, bye.